Are you worried about running out of money in retirement? If so, know that you're not alone and that running out of retirement is always the number one concern that people have in every survey I've ever looked at. So in this video, I'm going to give you guys the top six ways people run out of money in retirement and solutions that you can do today to help prevent them. So let's jump right into it. Reason number one, and perhaps the most popular reason out there, is for medical debt, right? So even though you have Medicare insurance, we know that medical concerns come out of the blue and Medicare doesn't cover everything. So that's one way that people can quickly run out of money. So the best ways to mitigate against this risk is to first make sure you always have insurance coverage, whether that's health insurance today or Medicare retirement. And then you want to make sure you have a supplemental plan to cover anything that Medicare doesn't cover. And on top of that, long-term care is also not covered in Medicare. So that's where things like long-term care insurance or having some kind of plan around paying for long-term care can come into play. It's always not a bad idea to have some money set on the side to help cover these things, whether it be deductibles or just one-off medical expenses that you would reasonably expect to pay. Now, I've seen some people set aside, you know, $100,000, $200,000 as a just-in-case part, and we'll talk about that more later. But that seems like a bit too much and excessive because that money could be you know, earning you interest on the side instead of losing money just going for a what-if event. On the contrary, the whole point of insurance is to help protect you for those what-if events. So when you give money to insurance companies, they help you mitigate the risk. So they're on the hook for more money than typically you're paying into over your lifetime. So that's kind of the idea of insurance and why it's a good idea to at least look at insurance products when dealing with healthcare concerns to help offset this very real risk that you may face. And another thing to know about medical debt is that this type of debt isn't something that has to be paid right away. A lot of people kill themselves trying to pay off these medical bills. But in fact, you really don't have to do that. I'm not saying you don't have to pay it. I'm just saying that you don't have to pay it all at once. When you have medical debt, this money can be spread out over a payment plan if you talk to the provider over a length of time. And there's no interest on medical debt or medical loans. So this money, like I said, isn't going to cost you anything where you pay off today or paid off the next 15 years, it's not gonna cost you anything extra. So it's always in your benefit when you're dealing with zero interest environments to spread the money out as long as possible. Give yourself as much time to pay back as you can. I can't tell you how many people I've seen tap into their retirement accounts early, pay taxes and penalties just to pay off this medical debt that wasn't charging them any interest anyways. So they were the ones that really lost out in the long run because they lost all this money and then they have to try to build it back up again. They lost all the future interest that are earned so it's just a bad deal all around. So that's something you want to avoid. Another thing to know about dealing with medical debt is depending on your income levels, you can qualify for full or even partial forgiveness from certain hospital organizations. Most hospitals are going to have some kind of charitable fund. Depending on your income requirements, they might be able to work out a deal to kind of forgive this all. Now, this is all information that I wish I knew when I started my career, because when my twins were born, they racked up a $600,000 bill. That's what you get when you have twins in the NICU born a month early for a whole month, right? So a $600,000 bill. Now, thankfully, we had a max out of pocket of about $15,000. So I was only on the hook for that much. But because I didn't know about this earlier, I was struggling as, a, you know, just starting off trying to pay off this medical bill. When in fact, because we're, we're at a low income at the time, we could have easily just applied for charitable, a charitable thing. And we could have got the entire thing pretty much waived or at least partially forgiven would have saved me a lot of money. So take it as a lesson for me. Always ask if you can at least apply for the charitable uh, forgiveness opportunities. No, no harm, no shame in applying for charitable to remove medical debt. Now, reason number two why people tell me run out of money in retirement is they haven't saved enough money to begin with. So it's very important that you need to start saving money as early as you can. Even if it's just a little bit, it also adds up over time. I've worked with some paraprofessionals in the past who are only able to do about $20 a month in their 30s, and they weren't able to do much more than that. So they kept doing $20 a month. And, you know, over, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, they actually had, you know, a few thousand dollars saved up. And then they had some big bill come off and they were able to cash into it and pay off whatever that bill was. Now, that wouldn't have been possible if they didn't take the time to be contributing this entire time. Now, I'm not saying you always want to cash things out like that when things come up and that might have been the best use of funds, but at least they had the option for that because they're diligent about saving for that long. So it's always important to save up as early as you can and then increase your savings over time. As state employees, especially school district teachers, 
you guys have a pay salary schedule. You know exactly what your pay is going to be for this year, as well as the years to come. So you, there's really no excuse that you can't be saving more each year. You know you're going to get a raise. Just put a small percentage of it away into your 403B, DCP, Roth IRA, somewhere. Put it away. The trap that a lot of people run into is they don't save until it's too late. And by that time, you have to save two to three times more than what someone you know 10 years younger than you would have to do just to try to catch up to them. The less time we have, the more we have to put away, and then we have to hope for better markets. So it's if you do yourself a really big favor, just get started saving early. And the rule of thumb has always been 15%. That, usually, that rule is usually for somebody in their 30s. If we're getting started later, 40s or 50s, at that point, you gotta pretty much do whatever you can to make up for that amount. I've never had someone come to me for retirement advice and say, hey, I have too much money saved. Right. So the more you can save, it's always a good thing. If you need access to the money, remember that Roth IRAs, your money can come out anytime you want to. Right. It's just the growth has to stay in there until three and a half. But your money is free and clear to come out whenever you want. If you're saving to the DCP, that's kind of hands off for a lot of things, except for hush withdrawals. If you're going to like a 403B for 1K plans, they have hardship and loan provisions that you can tap into the money if you need it down the road. So if access is your concern, there's a lot of ways around it. So the best thing you do is just get in the habit of saving for yourself first and spending later. Now, reason number three is being too conservative. Now, a lot of people think it's the opposite. If I have too much risk in retirement, I'm going to lose all my money. Now, losing money when the markets go down is only for two reasons. One, you panic and sold at a loss. Or two, it's because the market went to zero. Now, assuming you're not investing in some sketchy stocks, if you have it diversified in a series of stocks or better index or mutual funds, unless every single one of those companies goes to zero, you're not going to lose all your money. You might lose a lot of it during these market turbulent times, but it's not loss. These are paper losses. And if you just didn't look at your statement, you wouldn't even have noticed it anyways. Right. So being too conservative is a real risk. And that's where I see a lot of people make mistakes. They're so worried and concerned that they're going to lose all their money in the market that they put it all in cash or bonds or just really low risk funds. And I get the idea. The idea is if it's not invested very much, it's not going to be, it's going to be less volatile. I'm not going to lose as much in the market. It's more stable. And I like security. And I understand that. The problem is if we're staying flat, we may not be losing, but we're also not going to be gaining. And if we're not gaining, inflation is going to slowly creep up on us. Over time, the value of your dollar goes down. It's going to cover less and less. And you're just losing future earning income potential down the road. So put it another way, if you're going to work one day and your car decided to break down on you and you have to spend a lot of money fixing it up, maybe you have to go and buy a new car to replace it. And you just got to think about how if you didn't have to go to work, you wouldn't have all these car bills and you don't have to eat out. You just save a lot of money just by not going to work. So you said, and to avoid these losses, I'll just stop working. And you know, then, then I don't have to worry about paying these bills. Now, I'll see that logic doesn't work, right? Because we all understand working and income, right? And the reason it doesn't work is we know while we might save money in the long run, we have a certain amount in our bank account that we need to support our lifestyle on, and I'm going to drain into it if we don't have the income to replace it. So when it comes to our investments, when we're too conservative, we may be eliminating the losses, but we're not bringing in the interest to help replace any losses or income needs that we have in the future. So hope that analogy kind of helps you guys understand why it's important to always have some market exposure. Now, I'm not saying you have to invest at all, but you need more. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the whole 60-40 thing. I like to build custom plans for clients that I tapped into their income uh, situation. So it should always have, you know, some money in cash and bonds for sure. You want to have a safe pot, but you also need to have a portion always invested in the market to continue to grow so you can replace income that, as you need it. Right. So all that actually ties into reason number four and is that people get too emotional. So when we get emotional, we tend to make rash decisions that don't make a lot of sense, right? And this is exactly why, you know, the market's on average, you know, 8% over the long run, most investors average just two because they get too emotional and they make mistakes that they otherwise could avoid if they had the right help or if they just stayed the course. So just go back to last year in 2022, we had a really bad year, both for the stock and bond market. And the survey came out that over half of 401k participants across the country stopped putting money in to their 401k plan. They just straight up didn't put money in any anymore. And in fact, I had a couple of clients reach out to me saying that they didn't want to contribute anymore because the market was bad. And you got to remember that the markets are going to go up and down. 
investing in a bad market or a down market is actually the better time to invest because you're buying it at a cheaper rate. So when the market eventually turns around, your stock price is going to increase. As the stock prices increase, your rate of return it will increase much faster because you're buying it at a cheaper price. And so it's important not to make these emotional decisions. Now, how can this affect your retirement in terms of running out of money? I've seen it happen to two clients personally, and both of them, very emotional decisions, went against advice, went with what they thought was right, and just three, four years in retirement, they have absolutely nothing left to, uh, to go off of. So in one case, it was someone that needed a new truck. They didn't actually need it. They wanted it. It had to be new, had to be all these things, whatever. It was their money. I just said, you know, do what you want. Just know that it's not my advice. They went and bought it, $40,000. Then comes tax time. They have to pull out more money to cover the tax bill on it. So they said, hey, I need $10,000 for taxes. In fact, if they, need, they actually had to pay taxes on their tax bill. So now they have to pull out $12,000 just to net the 10 to hand it over to the IRS. So the truck didn't cost them 40, it cost them about 52. Now this person, they have a lot to save us to begin with, but just a couple more decisions like that over the years. And then there was no money left. The other client, same thing. They wanted their mortgage paid off. And we get this question a lot. I want to have no debt, uh, no mortgage. So I want $140,000 to just pay it off. Now, even though that their interest rate is only 3% of the time, and if cashing out their time, would put them in the 22% bracket, they didn't care. They wanted it paid off. Didn't matter which way I spun the numbers, they just wanted to do it. So they signed a disclosure saying that they're going against advice. They took the money out, paid it off. Now they have essentially no money left. So now they have pretty much no money left. 2022 happens. They don't like the president or what's going on with the economy. They cash out the rest just to put in their savings account. Now they've officially, for the most part, run out of money uh, for retirement. It's just sitting in savings, doing absolutely nothing for them. So both cases, they're just emotional decisions against advice that ended up bankrupting them. All for what? To avoid paying interest or on their debt. Now, paying 3% interest would have been a lot cheaper than paying 22% in taxes. Now, what they don't probably realize still, despite me telling them, is that in a couple of years from now, they're going to get hit with higher Medicare bills. Because when we make too much money in retirement, and our income goes over a certain threshold, Medicare has a two-year lag. So two years later, they're going to find their, your income statement from the IRS, and they're going to adjust your premiums accordingly. So you're going to get a, they're going to get a surprise this year of having to pay more Medicare expenses. So when you add it all up, in the end, they're actually paid a lot more in terms of you know, fees and Medicare premiums to the IRS and the government. And they would have to the company if they just would have sat still and just paid the 3% interest on a decreasing balance, right? Because as your mortgage goes down, the 3% is based on the principal. So as it pays down, your interest payment goes less and less every single year. So they lost, a, they lost big time with that move, right? So the best way to solve for number four here, the emotional aspect is you want to seek a professional's opinion and advice, and you want to make sure you want to listen to it before acting on your own emotions, because more often than not, it's not going to work out. Now, reason number five is going to not having a budget, right? Or not having a spending plan. Everybody needs to know how much money goes out. You don't necessarily have to calculate it down to the, you know, the penny, but you need to have a pretty good idea of what's coming, what's going out versus what's coming in. That's the only way you know if you can maintain your standard of living in retirement. I've seen a couple of people who just said, hey, my budget is, you know, 7,000 a month. We do the numbers, their income's only five. I'm like, we got a problem here. Then when they dig through their budget, they started cutting stuff and they ended up saying that they're only spending about 3,000 per month. So they were fine. But in their heads, they thought they were spending a lot more than they did. Now that's a good case to be in, right? Spending less than you actually were. You want to avoid the opposite happening, right? Spending more than you realize, which is where most people are usually guilty at. The easiest solution to this is to just start tracking your spending. It doesn't take a lot of time and effort. You can actually just use some apps to do it for you. They link to your bank accounts, credit cards. They track all your spending. You can set your own budget up. It takes some time to set up, but I'll give you a quick and easy idea of what categories you're over or under in, and you can have much more awareness of what's going on in your finances. It's also a great way to catch credit card fraud way ahead of the time if you're constantly looking at this app you know, and monitoring your expenses. So the app I personally use myself is called Mint. I know there's just a lot of other ones out there, but that's the one I've liked the best. It's not perfect, but it gets the job done throughout the month. I'm just kind of keeping tabs on things. Personally, I like Excel better because I can really get down into the details. So one exercise you could do, and I actually just did this last month, is I went back through all of 2022, 
pulled all of the credit cards, bank statements, and just kind of put it on different tabs and just summarize roughly what the budgets were for each category. Now, this was helped me get an idea of what we're actually spending in each category, where we could be better at, so I could be better for 2023. So I practice what I preach, and I go through the same exercise I put my clients through. Yes, it takes a lot of time, energy, and work. I usually was doing it at nighttime on the couch while watching something on TV, but it's something that can be done. If you do it monthly, it's a lot better than going back through a whole year because that was not very fun, but just doing it once a month, going through it a couple hours here or there, it's going to end up saving you a lot of money in the long run. And if you're doing nothing but sitting on your phone or watching TV at night anyways, it's not a bad use of time. All right, and number six here is not having an income plan. So an income plan is knowing exactly where your income is going to come from. While we're working, we know we go to work, we get a paycheck. That's our income plan. Retirement, no one's going to pay us necessarily, right? Social security can be collected at some point in the future, and we'll have that income coming in. If you work for the state or have some kind of pension, we have that check coming in automatically. And then on top of that, you're going to have to figure out if I need to tap into my investments, how am I going to do so? What funds am I going to hold in them? When am I going to sell them? When should I rearrange them? So you need to have an idea of your income plan as far as where the money's going to come from and how you're going to set yourself up for success. Does an annuity make more sense? Should you stay in the market? There's a lot of decisions that you have to look at before going into retirement. Now, just because your social security and pension doesn't mean that it's just, you know, turn it on whenever I want. There's still income planning needs to be done. The earlier you take social security, the less money you, you get. It also changes how things are taxed to a degree. So collecting earlier or later may not always be black and white. It depends on your specific situation and what tax strategy you're using, if they're going to work out in your best interest or not. So you need to have an income plan for social security. When am I going to collect? When's my spouse going to collect? When am I going to switch from my benefit to spousal benefits? All of that is things that you need to think about before turning on your benefits. The same goes for your pension plan. Waiting until the fall of your 65 or 62 isn't something you necessarily always have to do. I've made a few videos on how you could always separate earlier, bridge the gap with other investments, and you could you know, set up your income plan that way, or you could just straight up take a penalty and collect your pension even earlier, and if that makes sense for you. So there's, again, and it's not black and white when collecting your pension. If you want the sub retirement, yeah, you can wait to those ages, but you might be missing out on years of retirement by going earlier, taking slightly less money, which a lot of people would argue is well worth it. Now, I'm sure there are many other ways that people can run out of their money, such as, you know, getting swindled and, you know, gambling, things like that. There's always different ways to do it. But these are the top six that I've personally seen affect people the most, working exclusively with Washington State employees since 2015. Please like and subscribe to the channel for more updates like this one. So I'll catch you guys all next week. Remember that your future depends what you do today.